Welcome to episode 214 of the Thunder Underground podcast. Trent and Jason here. And this week, we have got Ricky Brooks, the bass player for the Nixons. How awesome is that? When we started this, the Nixons was, we wanted to get somebody from the Nixons on this thing. Yeah. And we did it. 213 episodes later. All the Oklahoma love, man. (laughs) That's right. Very glad that not only that they got back together, but we got to talk to one of them here. All right. We are sponsored, as always, by DEB Concerts and Med Farm. All right. Is there anything else we need to talk about before we say the Nixons? Uh, let's get into this Nixon stuff, man. All right. They are, as we talked about here and as we've talked about, you know, several times on the podcast, they've been back together now for over two years. Or no, almost two years. It was, I think their first show back was like May or June in 2017. We're coming up on that two-year mark, and it's very cool because, you know, it's something that they were kind of spread out around the country now because, you know, Zach yeah. lives in Nashville, Ricky lives in Utah, yeah, and then you've got Jesse and John live here, but then John's touring the world with yeah, Seether. Seether, yeah, he's everywhere. So it's kind of something that I just didn't expect to happen unless if they did it with maybe a different drummer if it did happen, mm-hmm. but... It's cool to hear, well, you're here coming up, that, you know, John was kind of a big part in making this happen. Yeah. So I'm really glad that, you know, just from a fan's perspective that it has happened because this is just one of those bands that never really got the, they got the accolades here in this area because they're from here. But I think on a grander scale, they never got exactly what they should have. Yeah, opinion. I know. And, and I'm glad they got back the, the original four. Right. Um, Because... You know, their, um, you know, their EP and then FOMA for me was so important, you know, because they were, it was modern and it had alternative, but it was also heavy and fiery and, and, you know, it was dangerous and that really connected with me and the fact that they were from Oklahoma, all four of them, that really, really goddamn motherfucking connected with me, you know, and inspired me um so for the 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 core the original four to be together doing this is awesome yeah yeah and if you miss the fact that they re-released halo here this past year halo yes um that's what i was trying to yeah. for i guess it was the 25th anniversary maybe last year or the year before okay and you know they re-released it on vinyl which is really cool and then like you said they had foma of course which was the the major label debut, and then they had the EP six before yeah. Halo. But yeah, so really glad, like we said after at the top of this, that we finally got a member of the Nixons on here. That's right. So let's get into it. Here's Ricky Brooks, bass player of the Nixons. Junebug Spade and the Tits um, from uh, Wichita. And Jesse m- mentioned, well, they're kind of metal guys. You'd probably be able to talk their language. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> nice, nice. Since you guys have reformed, you've played several shows in Oklahoma, some in Texas. Have you guys had any thoughts about branching out and doing shows in other parts of the country? Or you just kind of stick into this area? Well, you know, uh, touring, you have to be able to, it has to be something that's sustainable. And uh, our pockets of uh, where where our following seems to be, our, uh, the strongest places are in Texas. Texas by far. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have, we have these weird little uh, places like up in the east, like in Chicago and New York where we we did pretty well up in there, but it's the in-between places that would be a challenge as far as booking a tour. And I I feel like we would have to have, you know, some good material, new material um, 
to try to do that. And we'd need a double bill. You know, bands now uh, really suffer unless they're on a good double bill. So if we were out with the Toadies or uh, somebody like that, um, we'd probably be up for doing something like that. But we we got a, we had we would need a new album album and everything first. And John is in Seether, so we're really only able to do this when he's at home, which is almost ne- never never. <laughs> yeah. You know, Seether. Seether tours. And when John leaves he's gone for a year. And uh yeah. So w- whenever he's back we we try to do a couple of gigs. Try to get together and stuff. Well, when you guys released Song of the Year in 2017, that was the first song that included that classic lineup in well over 20 years. Like, is that something that you personally ever thought you would see happen again? No. No. Uh, <laughs> not at all. I I, uh, I had not talked to Zach in probably 17 years. Wow. And... Uh, yeah, uh, Jesse Jesse had tried to get the band together a few times. Uh, he he called me right before I went to South America, and uh, I had I had actually just broken my wrist. So not only did I not want to do it, I couldn't do it, and I, I couldn't make myself want to do it either. And uh, and then a couple of years ago, when I was living up here in Utah. Um, uh, my brother told me, "Hey, you know, see, there's going to be in uh, in Salt Lake, and you've probably never seen them, which is true. I I quit listening to rock bands altogether, um, but I went down there to see them. They were out with uh, Nickelback, and I was sitting there on the bus talking to John, and he was like, uh, "Man, we need to we need to do some Nixon's reunion thing," and I was. I was like, no way, man. <laughs> I can't think of anything more embarrassing than uh Well, you know, it's like looking at your high school yearbook. You know, it's not I'm not embarrassed of what we did mm-hmm. at all. I think we did what we did and I think we were pretty good at uh doing what we did, especially live. But um I don't know, going back and I was so it was doing music altogether was so far away from uh, what I thought about ever. I hadn't touched a stringed instrument in at least 12 years. Wow. Wow. But yeah, yeah, I quit listening to rock bands altogether. I just, I worked on vintage motorcycles and, and then I took long motorcycle trips. Like South America was about a year and I went up, uh, up to Alaska four or five times. And that was pretty much it. Yeah. So we lost interest in rock bands. <laughs> so, um, is that, was that kind of the, you and, um, you and John kind of meeting up and was that kind of the, the, the initiation of the reunion or how did that, that all come about? Yeah. That kind of, uh, planted the seed, you know, yeah. it was the first time that I'd ever actually, thought about it 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 was really flattering that he would even like you know think that way of me you know because i didn't think of myself that way at all i was just you know guy that rides a motorcycle i didn't mm-hmm. think of myself as somebody that gets in front of people and you know strums away on strings and jumps around and yeah anyway i yeah and then about uh, a couple of years later jesse called me and I was just like, no, man, no, no, no. You know how much work that is? <laughs> and it was, it was a lot of work, you know, it really was a lot of work to, to be able to get to the point to, to where you can perform on a level like guys that play the same 15 songs every night. That is, that is really, really a challenge. Um, but yeah, we, we did that and it was so fun and, you know, it really healed a lot of old wounds and, um, now it's like, I think about it every day, 
think about those guys every day. Yeah. Even though I live way up here, um, I talk to Jesse almost every day, and I probably hadn't talked to him in eight years. I talk to him almost every day now. So. Well, what was it like the first time the four of you got back together to start rehearsing? Was it, had you planned a lot yeah. like going up to that since you hadn't played? Well, uh, I prepared a lot, you know, it's, it's probably not real cool for me to talk about how, how much work it really was. <laughs> and you'd, you'd think, you know, it's not that hard because, well, you know, my parts are easy, you know, bass only has four strings, but when you to to be able to play on that professional level, it doesn't really matter if it's simplistic. I mean, it's it's really got to be perfect. But when we did finally uh, to get get together, we were pretty prepared, and um, it was really weird. The very first note, I remember it really distinctly. That very first note that the the four of us played together. Um, it's a little embarrassing, but it was kind of emotional, you know, that Jesse actually pulled us off to, to get us all in the same room together. It was, that was pretty cool. And then, of course, when we did play our first gig, um, you know, we did it at the, uh, uh, what's that place in downtown Oklahoma City? the Chevy Event Center, which is kind of a big place. All these people that flew out from New York and Florida and New Orleans and California, there were people that flew out from all over the country just to just to see us do that. Um, it was it was pretty humbling. Well like I mean you and you and John and Jesse had played together after the Nixons ended and you were obviously out of the band towards the end of it. Was it something that they had to talk Zach into making that lineup with you back? I mean, I don't know what your guys' relationship is. You don't have to go into that, but I just wondered if it's something they, like yeah, you said, the, Jesse had to make happen. Well, I don't know uh, what went on in the in the uh, background, you know, that I wasn't involved with those kind of conversations. But I, I do know that the the – Probably the biggest wounds were between Zach and I, because um, we were the two that had not spoken at all. See, they uh, they fired me uh, in the '90s, and then Jesse and John left the Nixons and started another band with me. Did you guys? Did you know that? Yeah, yeah, I actually didn't know that until. After the fact, but a few years ago, I listened to that EP. Yeah, I, I was I was trying to manage a band called Owl, and uh, after they fired me, I joined Owl, and of course, that didn't really that didn't really work. The band broke up pretty quick, uh, and then Jesse and John started a band with me and the singer from Owl, and that that's what Hover was. Yeah, I think so, uh, I, I think I saw you guys with Fuel once. Yeah, yeah. It, it that came was like our second gig. Yeah, that was a, that was our second gig. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. We moved up. You know, we we were on our way. We had a deal with uh, RCA. We went up to New York and got a deal with RCA, and then um, it was right after nine eleven, and and Napster. And bands were getting dropped, and yeah. our our record deal just kind of evaporated. And uh, and our singer he went to Colorado, and John joined uh, he joined South FM first. He went down to Dallas. He joined this band South FM. They were on MCA, and he was only there for a little while. And then he joined Seether, and he just stayed with Seether. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I was I was pretty proud of what what Hover was doing, you know. I, I kind of liked that direction at the time, what we were doing. But after that, I was just you know no more rock banding for me. <laughs> so <laughs> until until now, you know. Yeah. Now I'm Mr. Rock fan. 
<laughs> You're saying like you didn't play the instrument, you know, the bass for like 12 years. Was that, did it feel natural to pick it back up or is it something you had to like coax yourself into doing after you guys talked about doing this? It, it wasn't natural at all. Okay. It was really hard. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, really hard. I had to practice to a metronome all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, I I learned whole albums of, you know, other music just to work on my timing. And uh, just, just you, you guys play guitar, right? Yeah, I do, yeah. I know. You know how different it is when you stand up versus <laughs> when you're sitting down? Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you, got, you have to be really good at standing up and playing in the dark. Yeah. Because you can't see it's all those little subtle things that make you that separate a good performer from a good musician. Because you can be a great musician and not be able to perform. <laughs> you got to be able to play in the dark. Yeah. You have to be able to play standing up. You got to be able to play for a long time. You have to be able to play in time and not be able to hear yourself, hear sound bouncing all over the room, sing and play at the same time. It's, it's harder than it looks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, it, was, it was very challenging. I, I, I never sit down during rehearsal. Yeah. That's like a rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you sent us this unreleased Nixon song, and I know you guys have posted pictures in the last couple months of working in the studio. So are we, is there an EP or an album possible coming, or is it just one song for now, or what's the deal? Well, we work on music um, up here in, in Utah. Um, I'll like record some riffs, and then I'll I'll kind of try to put them together and send them to uh, John. And if it sounds like it's going to turn into a song, then we'll go ahead and cut drums on it and, uh, and try to build a song around it. And then when we get together, we'll try to really hammer it out uh, in a rehearsal space. Um, so, yeah, if we if we have enough music that we're happy with, I would say look for an EP. Um, but I, I couldn't say when, because mm -hmm. we have to be pretty happy, pretty happy with it. Uh, in, in the old days, you know, we we were pretty good at making people uh, hear with their eyes because we toured all the time. We played 300 shows a year. So um, a lot of our, our uh, recordings didn't really, yeah, they, a, lot, a lot of our recording, even though we thought about it a lot, compared to the way we perform live, our recordings were sort of an afterthought. We were just like, we're going to finish that. Okay, let's finish it. Okay, we'll move on. Then we go on the road. So our uh, our live show was much more persuasive than our recordings. And nowadays, you can't really do that. Your recordings have to be so strong. I don't mean the fidelity. I mean, the part writing is so much better now than it than it was in the 90s. You just don't get away with it, you know? I, I really feel like bands are better now than than they were in the 90s. And I think we're, we're kind of living through a time where some of the best rock music is being recorded. People keep saying that uh, uh, rock bands suck now. And I just think they're listening to something other than what I'm listening to <laughs> right. then. <laughs> yeah, I've always thought that because people always say like, you know, rock's dead or there's not any good stuff out there. I'm like, well, maybe not on the radio, but there's every year there's a shitload of great albums from bands that aren't mainstream coming out, you know? Yeah, I know. The, the whole model has changed. You know, songs are a lot longer because the bands aren't trying to get on the radio. You know, like Paul Bearer, their songs are like twelve or fourteen minutes long. They're great. I, I went to see I, I went to see them and they played like eight songs because they're all long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
And the, you can tell those guys aren't trying to get, they're not trying to get rich. You know, they're not trying to get on the radio. They're just making great music. And yeah, you're, you're right. They, they were, man, they were so good. Well, I thought that that's, was that song you sent us? Oh yeah. Crutch. Or Crutch. Yeah. yeah. Um, Crutch. I, yeah. I thought that had like a, it sounded a lot like the FOMA era stuff. Whereas I know like after you were out of the band, those, the albums had a little bit different sound to them. Is that your influence? Yeah. You think? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, that's, uh, well, I, I think we all really kind of wanted to go back to the, uh, Southern garage metal thing that we really were from the beginning. Um, you know, the sort of punk rock Southern garage metal thing that was being kind of half melted and half broken and held together by a giant roll of duct tape, which was John Humphrey. Cause that, we had like a really loose tight thing about our, live show that was uh, I couldn't say this one back then but now when I watch videos I'm like that's pretty cool we were we were pretty cool I was really hard on us back then <laughs> now I now I look back and I'm like man some of it was like really good <laughs> yeah but yeah most people are their own yeah. worst critic you know you guys released uh that that reissue of Halo on vinyl is there a chance we might see FOMA done the same way? I don't know. Uh, there's so many of the same songs on uh, FOMA. Yeah, true. And uh, I think the the band and our core fans really feel a lot more ownership over um, Halo because we did that on uh, we did it in a few days on a really low budget in a small studio down in Dallas. And, uh, yeah, I think that's much more the classic. A lot of our early fans like that record better anyway. You know, FOMA was the, it was sort of the classic, um, big record label, um, uh, kind of, which, you know, I, I think we overthought it a lot. So I, I don't. I don't think diploma. Probably not. Yeah. Even though I, I I do like a lot of those songs, uh, and we we do play them, and we play Sweet Beyond, and and we play FOMA. and so so looking back on your initial run in the nineties, what what stands out the most to you? Oh man. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I like, the, one of my fondest memories about the 90s is being able to play with bands that I like and discovering, you know, I was always the guy that was watching every local band or every opening band, every band that we played with. Yeah. You know, I would go out front and watch the Melvins. I would go out front and watch, you know, we played with Tool. Uh, I would go out front and watch everybody, yeah. you know. I would go out front and watch bands that I didn't like. And there, there were just so many uh, great new bands that didn't have a lot of commercial success, but were so worth seeing back then. Brutal Juice, they were, they were really great. And, you know, just there was oh, Ugly Stick. Do you remember Ugly Stick? I remember they were, they were from that Oklahoma. Home. They were from Oklahoma City. And uh, they got signed. They did some touring with um, um, Pantera. Okay. And uh, they, were, they were just one of those bands that, you know, you just wonder why no one knows who they are. And they were and they were a lot like uh, Conan. Have you guys listened to Conan? Yes. <coughs> yeah, they were kind of like that. Really slow, doomy. Yeah. Anyway, that, that that is one of my fondest, you know, memories of that whole era is being able to see bands that I thought were cool. Did you like I mean, you know, the Nixons are had a you know, a heavy sound, but you weren't like tool heavy or fight heavy. Like when you opened up for bands like that, was it did you ever get weird reactions or were the crowds always cool? You know, that's a good that's a really good question. 
because we, uh, yeah, we would play with bands like the Melvins, and we would play with I Hate God, and wow. you know. Um, no, man, we we were really good. <laughs> we were really good at. Uh, we were really aggressive, you know. Yeah. Um, and even when we would play, I, I don't know. I think we were pretty persuasive. I don't remember. I remember feeling exactly what you, what you're talking about. Like, oh man, we're, we're playing with the Melvins tonight. Uh, we're gonna get we're gonna get clobbered. But to be honest, that never happened. Uh, the the only the only thing I remember where people uh, maybe didn't like us. At least you know, opening is always hard, especially with Slash of Snake Pit or a big band like that. So like the first few songs, you know, they're just kind of standing there with their arms crossed. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we did get some of that with, when we were out with Slash. And we, and we did get some of that when we weren't like the hometown favorite or people didn't know who we were, but I think we were pretty, pretty persuasive. And there was also the fact that that 90s era was, it was sort of an alternative thing. You know, we weren't, it was okay to be, you know, Nirvana. You were still heavy and still, you know, sort of alternative-ish. Yeah. Right. So it, it was a little bit different. It was before Creed and Matchbox 20. It was before what a lot what you're talking about. A lot of the things that we did back then became taboo. Like a lot of bands, if they do something like the things that we were doing then, if they did it now, it would be sort of a little bit taboo. It wasn't really like that back then. Well, you mentioned when you went like 15 years without listening to rock music. Were you, what kind of music were you listening to? None. None at all. Man. Really, you know, I I went to uh, I I used to be in a drum and bugle corps and I played trumpet, soprano bugle, and I went to those music shows and I would go to shows like I don't know, um, you know, Broadway type musicals. I would go see Cats and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I I real honestly, um, I I was not interested in rock bands at all. I think through the uh, the early 2000s, I didn't like what I was hearing anyway, and so I was pretty uninterested in it. But the great thing was, uh, you know, when when I started uh, listening to music again, it was because, well, we're going to do this Nixon's thing, and I need to figure out what bands do now. You know, I kind of need to like like listen to stuff. So I started uh, uh, I started turning on these I, I start I opened up YouTube and I just started listening to um, live music festivals, you know, because there would be a whole bunch of bands, and yeah, I kind of wanted to see what was relevant and what was really going on, and I would hear like Clutch. I was like, wow, man, I remember playing with those guys. They're still they're still doing things. And they're really doing really well. Yeah. And so, and that's how I discovered Red Fang. You know, I was sitting there listening to this music and I, I was like, man, this is awesome. What am I listening to? And I look over and it looked like, uh, it looked like the roadies were, <laughs> had, had started their own band. And I was like, <laughs> this is awesome. So they, they, they became my favorite band because, you know, it was kind of like, well, it's okay to be, kind of older guys and look like normal guys and like they they literally they're they're like my favorite band now <laughs> uh, but yeah just rediscovering rock has been like one of the coolest things you know i go to rock shows as often as i can yeah most of the bands that you had mentioned to me were kind of in that same that kind of stoner rock doom metal kind of vein as they're is that where it's been for you? Or have you listened to stuff outside of that as well? Well, uh, yeah, I, I listen to, um, 
I've gone to see a lot of bands that I didn't expect to like. You know, like Death Heaven. Uh, Death Heaven. I didn't think I was really going to like them. Yeah. I just I just thought the guitar work was so incredible that I was just like, I'm going to go see these guys because you know. <laughs> but you know, I they won me over. I thought they were great. And um, Paul Bearer, I didn't really think I was going to like them. I hardly knew anything about them. You know, I listened to them the day before the the show. I downloaded their their set list, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go see them. And that ended up being one of the one of the best shows. So Stoner Doom, yeah, I I like a lot of it, even though there's a lot of it that's just an awful lot the same. Yeah. Well, I like small venues. I like seeing bands in places that uh, I don't like seeing a band in a place that's bigger than like seven hundred seater. Yeah. yeah, they they don't they don't sound as good. You know, if it's in a big place and the members of the band are like the size of your thumb, they're like <laughs> way out there. It's yeah. just not as powerful. Well, you mentioned you're going to Baroness and Deaf Heaven show, right? Coming up. Yep. yep. Have Have you listened to Zill and Arter? They're also. Who is it? Zill and Arter. They're also on that bill. I tell everybody. No, I, no, I I didn't know that they were on that. Yeah, I tell everybody I know about this band because they're like, I cross the the guy took old Negro spirituals and combined them with black metal. <laughs> so it's oh cool. It's pretty interesting. So check that out before you go. Oh yeah, I will. I will. I usually, the day of a, a show, um, I'll I will download their set list and I'll listen to it all day. Um, you know, I I hadn't heard of King Buffalo. Oh yeah. And uh, I've seen them. I'm about to see them for the third time. Wow. You know. Yeah. I. I. Uh, just I. I I had heard them you know, in passing, but, you know, it didn't really catch my ear until I, you know, I turned them on and then I went and got in the bathtub. <laughs> Some of this music, you're like, you really have to pay attention to it. It requires more attention. Like the old Pink Floyd albums that we listened to. Yeah. You, know, you really had to listen to them quite a few times before you kind of got it. Right. Yeah. I, I I like that. I, I like being challenged a little bit. Elder was like that. I had to listen to Elder over and over before I... Have you guys listened to Elder? Huh. I have not. Oh, man. I mean, if you like proggy stuff, I, I couldn't believe that they were playing this stuff, okay? It's it's incredible. So I, I, I actually bought a flight to Phoenix to see them. Wow. I, had to, I just had to see these guys play this stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was incredible. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, if you want to spend a lot of time listening to music, um, yeah, you might you might like them. We will check yeah, them out. Cool. Yeah. I mean, a little bit off subject, when during that time period you said you went to South America and you rode your motorcycle down there, like what was that whole experience like for you? Well, it was, it was pretty amazing, you know. Um, I went down to Mexico. I spent a month in Mexico without being able to speak Spanish. I never really knew what I was eating. I didn't know how the currency worked. I didn't know how much money I had. Um, and when I got to Guatemala, I spent five weeks in a Spanish school. I just found a Spanish school and tried to learn how to speak some Spanish. And it... You know, I uh, went to all the way through Central America. It's like a bunch of border crossings through Central America. And then I put my motorcycle on a canoe out and went out to sea and put it on a, a, a hundred year old steel sailboat. And they, they took me over to Colombia. So I went from Panama to Colombia illegally. They just <laughs> dropped me off in Cartagena on a on a dock in the middle of the big city and went and reported myself to immigration. They were really nice, you know, 
uh, Colombia was like super civilized. There's air conditioning and girls working there wearing perfume. It wasn't like Central America where it's, you know, all these Saddam Hussein looking guys with carrying machine guns. <laughs> Colombia was like super civilized. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was like a really, you know, real growing experience. By the time I got down to Tierra del Fuego, which is at the bottom of South America, it's actually an island. By the time I got down there, I was, uh, I had learned a lot about uh, people and culture and traveling and the language and, um, yeah, it was a, it was a tremendous growing experience that we definitely don't have time to talk about. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was pretty amazing. You know, it, it took me close to a year. I traveled with a lot of amazing people. You know, I was I was in the jungle one day in um, Ecuador. I was like riding through the jungle, and I I met this guy that was also riding a motorcycle. This guy from Colombia. I traveled with him for about a month. Um, yeah, I would just meet people and travel <laughs> with them for a while. And then, I, then I would be alone for a while, and uh, I really never knew where I was going to sleep from one night to the next. And sometimes, if I if I if I went to some small village and I liked it there, I would just stay for a week or two. Wow. Uh, <laughs> just walk around the village and meet the local people and eat whatever they eat. And anyway. And that's cool because that, that's the type of thing that people always talk about doing or dreaming about doing. Is that something that you had planned for a while or did you just up and decide to do it on short notice? <laughs> I, I had uh, I had taken quite a few long motorcycle trips up north. But, you know, that's Canada where they speak English. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's uh, people are not af- afraid of Canadians. <laughs> Everybody, we're scared to death of anything that's like south. But yeah. really, really, there's no reason to. I never got robbed. No, no one tried to murder me. I saw a lot of people who have never been murdered. I went to big <laughs> cities, you know, where they're, that are full of people who've never been murdered. <laughs> and, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a great. Uh, you know, it taught me a lot about humanity. You know, I saw cops in Mexico push people's cars uh, in the, you know, 100 degree heat. You know, I saw, I just saw a lot of um, acts of uh, humanity that uh, changed my worldview. And I wish more people could experience that, but it's probably not uh, practical for everyone. Yeah. I just happened to be single and had just enough money, and um, I had some help uh, financially from my employer that was doing like this video, uh, uh, this vlog thing for them. So I got some help that way, but I was going to do it anyway. Yeah. You know, you talked about working on bikes up until this reunion. Is that something you're still currently doing? Uh, I'm not doing re- restoring motorcycles, but, uh, you know, I still take motorcycle trips. You okay. know, I still have more motorcycles than I need. They're, uh, <laughs> you know, they're the big kind of off roady bikes. I'm really into motorcycle camping, sleep on the ground, catch a fish, you know, cook it and ride some, ride to some other place I've never been. I'm pretty into that whole thing. Well, as far as, you guys have this show coming up on the 15th and then you've got this song, like what are the, the immediate plans for the next ones you think here in 2019 looking forward? Well, I, I think, you know, we've got this, this gig and then we've got one in Wichita falls and we have one in, uh, in Dallas coming up in June. And a lot of it depends on John's schedule, right. but the plan is to keep, you know, working on music, you know, my whole office that, which used to be just be my work office is now like, I have a bunch of guitars on the wall. I, I only had one bass <laughs> with two strings on it, you know, and it hadn't been touched in 15 years. <laughs> now I have a bunch of, now I have, you know, rock band shit everywhere. 
you know, I have drums that I can barely play and I've got, uh, yeah. So we're just going to keep on working on new music and hopefully come up with something that, uh, uh, something that is presentable that can stand up to, um, what's going on today. Yeah. And, and hopefully have a, have a release. Uh, I can't give you a date. Yeah. As soon as we like something, <laughs> we'll release it. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as we like it. <laughs> but it's definitely going to be gar- garagey if I have anything to do with it. And <laughs> and it'll be noisy and uh, um, hopefully a lot more fun than, uh, I don't know, some of the FM rock that you are kind of used to and maybe a little bit tired of. Yeah. <laughs> were there any bands that I sent you just, uh, just out of curiosity, were there any bands that I sent you that you hadn't really listened to? Yeah, there was a few on that list that I hadn't heard. I'd have to pull it back up and look. I know, but like I've listened, and, you know, and is there, there, is there any awesome music that you've been listening to that I should listen to? Cause you could totally send it to me. I'm like, just a fiend for <laughs> new rock bands, especially especially the do-it-yourself bands. You know, I saw Conan the other day. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, awesome, man! You could feel that in your lungs. <laughs> <laughs> we we really incredible. liked a band called Child Bite. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. No, no. Uh, Tri- Trilobite. Child Bite. Child bite. Yes, they're they're. No, kind of, I, have, I haven't heard them, but send it to me on the uh, on the Facebook Messenger, and I will definitely listen to it. Yeah, they're kind of um, they're kind of an avant garde kind of metal all over the place. It's uh, it, it's definitely a do it yourself thing. So, yeah, we'll send that. Oh, to cool. You. Yeah, yeah. A, a, another one of my favorite bands that I you know kind of recently discovered. You know, I went I went to see Red Fang. I've seen them three times in the last year. Yeah. Um, but I went to see them in Nebraska, and uh, I saw them with Big Business. I, oh. I, I'd seen Big Business a couple times too. But uh, the the first band was uh, the guitar player guy that was in Torch. Do you ever listen to Torch? Yeah, I saw them open up for Clutch. Yeah, right, yeah, that yeah. we saw that. I remember them. Yeah, well, the the guitar player guy he he now has another band called dead now and okay. I, I saw them they did a tour with red fang i saw them and um and <laughs> i bought one of their I, I i went to see red fang and i left with a dead now t-shirt because it was like the coolest funniest <laughs> shirt ever but uh if you listen to their ep man just you know Exercise your neck a little first because you'll definitely wear it out. It's pretty <laughs> rocking. That guitar sound. If you go listen to Dead Now, go listen to that guy's guitars. I, th- I think he he works for um, Acorn. I think he builds pedals. Oh wow! But that is an aggressive sound that I've never heard on anything else. If you go listen to Dead Now. You you might like that. Huh? Have you heard of a band called Mountain of Smoke? No, there, it's like a, a band uh, with the guitar player from the Sword. That oh, really? Yeah, that he's in now, and I, I follow with, with him. So I, I followed their Instagram, but they don't. They're just working on stuff. They might have a clip or something, but they don't really have a whole song to listen to yet. I wondered if you'd heard of them. No, uh, no, but I, you know, I saw them, and yeah, I found them here. Yeah, I will definitely look them up. Sweet. I'll definitely listen to them. Yeah, it yeah. looks like they have a couple of videos. Yeah, we we love yeah. the sword. Yeah, you probably like the earlier stuff. I I actually I actually liked um, uh, the new album. Yeah, Low Country. Oh, oh you like Low Country? Or, yeah, high, or High Country? God, I get I get it all mixed up. <laughs> but high Country. Yeah. That that album was pretty cool to me. I thought. Well, I I like all of it for different reasons. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I feel a little bit lucky because I didn't listen to bands for so long that everything is new to me. Yeah. That has to be like, cool. Yeah. Like Mastodon is a new band to me. 
Yeah, that's <laughs> like, awesome. <"Ew." laughs> I'm like, man, I got to listen to this Mastodon band. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're pretty good. <laughs> uh, I look them up and they're like, oh, man, they've been around for about 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> And then a few bands I've also um, discovered, and then like the darkness. You know, one morning I was like, "Oh man, this is darkness band. Oh, this is kind of funny. This is pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, this is cool. Oh, they, oh, they broke up. Yeah. Oh, they're back together. Oh, oh, they they just played in Salt Lake yesterday. <laughs> oh man, I just missed them. <laughs> wow. So yeah, I mean, I'm like so behind on everything. <laughs> it's all new. <laughs> So anything post like 2003, we should send you. Is what you're saying? <laughs> well, not everything. Well, no, you know, I mean. a lot. Yeah, that we think you might like. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I, it's not just doomy metal either. You know, I like Russian circles a lot. I kind of discovered them, but I also went to see uh, the War on Drugs, which is not at all metal anything yeah right and i'm probably gonna go see um uh crap what's that guy's name he was in the war on drugs shoot now i can't uh kurt uh, kurt vile i'm probably okay. gonna go see him in the in the next couple of days and that's like totally not metal anything at all so that's not just doomy metal it's other stuff too but yeah, I do kind of like over the last year or so, I've just kind of wanted my head crushed. <laughs> oh, yeah. I really want to dance around. I just kind of want to get my head smashed. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. But I should mention uh, the tits. Do you remember the band uh, Lions? They had a song on the, uh, uh, what's that video game that all the kids play? You know, the Guitar Hero. Okay. They had a song on Guitar Hero and uh um what's the movie, what's the T V show about uh motorcycle guys? Oh god. The Orange County Choppers? Sons of Anarchy. Oh, Sons of Anarchy. Oh, god. First okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. First episode of the first season of Sons of Anarchy, uh Lions had a uh had a song on that. So the so the tits has some members from from Lions and Black Gasoline, and you know they're sort of a super group in a way of cool bands from Kansas. And then of course Junebug Spade is from Oklahoma, so people should be kind of familiar with them. But I'm horrible at promoting shows; <laughs> <laughs> not, not my thing at all. But hopefully, some people will come out that saw us with Smashing Pumpkins because we were. We were just in Tulsa in December. Yeah, yeah, I was, at, I was at that show. How was it? Oh, it was great. I mean, I was never... Oh, you saw it? You were there? Yeah. Well, how were we? Oh, yeah, I mean, it sounded great. I mean, I, the Brady always sounds great. And you guys, it didn't sound like anything was lost from from the old days. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Well, hopefully we'll be at least that good. No, we will. I mean, we we actually get better, you know, every time we play. Every time we play together, we we're a little bit better than the last time. Yeah, it's yeah, hard man. to pull off when you don't rehearse. Yeah, <laughs> right on, man. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to do this. Oh man, this is no problem. I I hope I gave you something that you can use. Oh, definitely. It's, oh yeah, yeah. This is great. It's really awesome that you let me do this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we appreciate you reaching out, and it's, you know, it's something that when we started doing this, having someone from the Nixons was always on our list of things to do, so we're glad to finally be able to do it. Yeah, thank you very much. There you go, Ricky Brooks of the Nixons. A huge thank you to him for taking the time out to talk to us there for quite a bit about the Nixons getting back together, everything they've got going on, and it was cool to talk to him about other music and the stuff he was doing in between all that, you know? Yeah, just, uh, yeah, that was awesome. Great conversation. Yeah. It's kind of one of those one of those ones you want, you know? Yeah, definitely. Kind of goes all different directions. Yeah, it's always interesting to me whenever, you know, you hate to sit down with someone doing one of these things and, like, just talk, you know, because you know that they want to promote their stuff or yeah. they want to talk about whatever, but you don't want to say, hey, so what's your favorite Iron Maiden song? Whatever, you know, yeah, just yeah. like... Even even though you know that 
it's you know might be a band they like later yeah. <laughs> because you think well maybe they're gonna be like why the fuck's this guy asking about this but yeah. it's always cool whenever you hear musicians talk about that stuff because exactly. you don't you don't always get to hear that you know yeah so yeah huge thanks to to ricky again this friday night march 15th at the state theater in Harrow, oklahoma the nixons will be headlining that show with june bug spade and the tits so be sure and get your ass out there if you can. If you're anywhere in the Oklahoma or Texas area, you need to get out there. I mean, they, they've been doing some shows, like we said, over the last couple of years, but they're still kind of sporadic. You know? mm-hmm. so, so any chance you get, you need to get out there and see them. I saw them this past December at the Brady Theater opening up for the Smashing Pumpkins, and I was happy as shit that I did. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, if this is your first time listening Say you found us because you're a fan of the Nixons and you like that 90s that 90s music scene we've had on Kevin Martin of Candlebox. We've had on both members of Local H. We've had on Tommy Victor of Prong. Had on Reed Mullen and Pepper Keenan of Corrosion and Conformity. We had Pepper Keenan on? Did I say that? God damn, I wish. I just fucking love Pepper Keenan, so it's just in my head, it's, I guess. Yeah, you're just you're willing it. I get that. We had Mike like, Dean and right. Reed Mullen. Which is just as great. That's right. <laughs> But yeah, and we've also had on guys from bands like Seven Dust, Kiss, Thin Lizzy. We've had on Damon Johnson from Brother Kane. There's another 90s That's right. band that was around the same time the Nixons were. Exactly. They toured together, I think. Did they really? Yeah, like during, when Seeds was out, they, they went out with the Nixons. Oh, nice. Pretty sure that was like a tour there for a minute. Well, if we ever get the chance to talk to Damon Johnson again, we should ask him about that. I, I I hope we will. I don't know. You never know. You never know. <laughs> but yeah, members of Megadeth, members of, who am I forgetting? Oh, God. About 50,000 bands. Tesla. Clutch, Tesla, fucking uh, The Obsessed. That's right. Crowbar, Insight. Super Joint. Super I, Joint, I, fucking I Hate God. Yeah. Uh, you know. Sons of Texas. Sons of Texas. There you go. Saving Abel, your favorite Sa- band. Uh, Shine Down. Shine Down. Saving it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. I ain't gonna fucking drowning don't, pool. Don't try. Don't. I'm not gonna down any band that's been on this. <laughs> I'm, don't try. You're trying to get me to talk shit. I'm not gonna do it. I know. You're stirring the pot, motherfucker. But drowning pool. C.J. Pierce is always a great interview. So yes, check out both we had of those him on episodes. Twice. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's a ton of stuff you can look back through. SoundCloud.com backslash Thunderdash Underground. We're also on iTunes, Google Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, MixCloud. Wherever you listen, be sure to subscribe, like, leave a comment. Anything you do like that helps us because it spreads, you know, other people see it that way. It helps out a lot with the podcast. Another thing that helps out is Patreon, patreon patreon.com. Just search Thunder Underground. Send us a few bucks. We've also got merch for sale at thethunderunderground.com. We're on all the socials, of course, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And we're also on every Monday night on 1027wsnr.com at 7 p.m. Central. So I think that that covers it. Uh, yeah, that yeah. wraps it up. Wouldn't that be cool if someone right now was listening to this podcast while they were driving somewhere between Baton Rouge and New Orleans? My God, we're done, man. I had to make that pun even though... Our guest did not. He wasn't play that even song. on that record. Dude. I know, but he plays it live now. I saw it happen oh, okay. in December, well, so I can say that. <laughs> I you, couldn't think of a way to fit like lyrics from Head or FOMA or Fellowship into like a pun, so I had to go with that. You and your puns, man. Hey, you're the one that said folked up. You know what? I do it so seldom I get to, and That's it's right. funny when I do it. I'm forcing oh, them, is what shit. you're saying? Did you just hear that? Oh, yeah. You're I saying, gotcha. that, you're saying I gotcha. that I force them? I, <laughs> you said it, not okay. me. All right. All right. Once again, check out Chad Malone on this podcast next week. Thanks to Ricky Brooks. And until next time. Thunder Underground, y'all. Thunder Underground, y'all.